as we go higher and higher. Good morning. I'm Reverend Brenda Brooks Alexander, one of the associate pastors here. We are so excited you have joined us for worship this morning in person and online. If you are in person, we invite you to fill out the attendance pads, pass those down to your neighbors. If you are online, we invite you to fill out the online platform. Welcome to our Cisco Fellowship joining us this morning. Also, we'd like for you to take a look at the back of your bulletin and you will find all of the upcoming events or you may visit fumcfw.org slash events. Uh, we also want you to be aware that our potlucks have started. And so if you have not been a part of our potlucks, we invite you to come this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Bring whatever you want and put it on the table and enjoy the fellowship of your family and friends. Now let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, source of joy and righteousness, enable us as redeemed and forgiven children evermore to rejoice in singing your praises. Grant what we sing with our lips, we may believe in our hearts and what we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives, so that being doers of the word and not hearers only, we may receive everlasting life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please rise in body or spirit as we call, do our call to worship. Every generous act of giving is a tribute to God's love for us. Be ready to listen and slow to react in anger. Lord, Keep your hearts and spirits ready to serve the Lord. Lord, open our hearts to hear, respond to your words of life in ministries of hope and peace. Amen. Before we sing hymn 62, all creatures of all creatures of our God and King, we will be singing verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7. And now let's pass the peace and greet our friends and family.
One of the things we do as a community of faith is affirm our beliefs together. The affirmation is the Apostles' Creed and is on page 881 in your hymnal. Please join me as we read together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come down for our time together. Kids, come see me. I love how little by little y'all have gravitated to center stage, which is great. That's where you belong. That's perfect. Thank you for encouraging me to do likewise. You know, during Vacation Bible School last week, we explored the church and how the building's not the church. The church is a community. The steeples, that's the song. The steeples, not the church. The pews are not the church. Because for us, people are the church. And, you know, some, some folks, not necessarily people here in this room, but a lot of people look at church as a bunch of things. Church as a building, church as a steeple, church as pews. Even prayer is not, is not uh, is just, is a thing. It's a thing that we say rather than an active conversation with God. Or they look at Scripture as a thing we listen to instead of a call to action to be God's people in the world. And, um, but here's the deal, and it's really important that we recognize that the church is about people, because people can do stuff. We can be active. We can move. Have you ever tried to play Simon Says with furniture? Well, I have, and it doesn't go well. Simon Says, jump up and down. It's not doing it. Simon Says, turn around. Jump up and down. Okay, you did that right because Simon didn't say. But other than that, but people, we can do things. We can be active. We can move. Several weeks ago, we had our children's time, and I talked about the importance of choosing good verbs, and all the English majors in the room loved it, and that was about it. But here's what I want us to do today to be more active, because I talked a lot about good verbs, and y'all sat and listened to me talk about action. And I thought, well, how about if we get real verby in here right now? So here's what we're going to do. I've got some verbs, some action words, and we're going to do what the action words say, and I'm going to try to make it real obvious. And any grown-ups who want to play, please join us. Okay, so some of the people that we read about in the Bible, Jesus' disciples, they sat and they listened. Everybody get your listening ears out. And everybody lean that way like you're listening. 
to Jesus' words. They broke bread together. Everybody break some bread and share it with your friends. They prayed, which we know was an active conversation with God. Then they followed Jesus. They stood up. And they opened the door. And they went looking for ways to help God's children. And we can follow Jesus today by the ways we put our faith in action. Everybody do a superhero pose. Right. Or Marvel, right? Depending. All right. We can call a friend to say hi and check on them. I'm still using the old-fashioned phone, as you can see. Give a pet a little extra of attention. Let's reach down and let's scratch our pet. Oh, they love the extra attention, especially after a thunderstorm or the 4th. Did anybody have a nervous dog on the 4th of July? I did. You can reach out to someone who's by themselves or by reach out. One of the best things we can do is practice reaching out. We can take your cup to the sink after dinner, rinse the cup, because the sink is not that cup's final place in the journey. We can dump out the water. We can open up this thing called a dishwasher. We can pull out the rack and put the cup in upside down. Everyone here can do all of those things to be helpful. We can get on a bus and we can go with our other church friends to build a house. Everybody, shoo, 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 with our mission trip friends down in Baton Rouge. Or we can play, let's all turn around, with new friends we meet at Camp Barnabas. Or we can sing, la, 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 in the youth choir on a tour. Everybody have a seat. We could, maybe one day, you might even get to sing the national anthem at your school, maybe for a function. Now, that's a big way to be active. And that singing and taking a risk like that, that's a good verb. And maybe you do great and everybody says how wonderful it was. But maybe your version of the national anthem doesn't go quite the way you'd hoped. And some people might even turn and whisper and point. Those aren't good verbs. And they're really not very active verbs either because that's an easy thing to do. Or they can sit on their couch and they can post about it online. That's not a very good verb. It's not a very active verb. It's not a very helpful verb. Even if you try your hardest and you really mess up, like in front of a lot of people, that's still you trying. And trying is always a good verb. And getting back to sitting and listening, that can be really active too. Like when our friend's having a really hard day, that's amazing. We can sit and we can listen. And one of the best things that we can do that's active is not try to say some magic words to make them feel better, but to simply sit and listen. Now, who wants to be active and go upstairs and play and let off some steam? Meet me right at that door. Let's go. And let us stand together as we sing our next hymn, Take Time to Be Holy, 395.
Good morning, my name is Maggie Rolfe. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. I will be reading the New Revised Standard Updated Edition and invite you to read along in your own Bible or in one of the Pew Bibles in front of you. It is in the Old Testament of the Pew Bible on page 229. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave birth to us by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of so all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if, there, for if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unsustained by, unstained by the world. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thank you, God. Thank you this morning. Thank you to our summer choir. For those of you who are always singing, for those of you who are trying it on for the summer, thank you so much for being a part of leading us in worship this morning. I uh, want to thank everyone who's a part of connecting us, whether in person here or online. I know a lot of folks are catching up as they travel over the course of the summer. So if that's you, welcome. I'm glad that you're joining us online or catching up later on. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the senior pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. I tend to share a lot about myself in messages and sermons, trying to share, share how my life of faith and my growth and discipleship is going. One of the things I don't share a great deal in messages is because I'm not really very proud of it. Is that I can have a bit of a temper. I can be uh, I can be pretty quick to getting angry, and uh, as you can hear in that scripture reading today, that can be a little bit relevant to our lives. And one of the things that happens when you're a preacher is uh, you kind of think on the scripture and meditate on the scripture all week long. I I so wish that writing a sermon was just sitting down at your desk, reading the scripture, going, hmm, and then writing out a sermon. That would be so great. That's how Brenda does it. It's super efficient, takes about 20 minutes. I wish it was that way. It's not that way. It's much more of a slow cooker than a microwave. It's a lot of thinking about it and just reflecting on it all week long. And so I've been reflecting on this week's scripture reading, and it, and it had an impact on my life. So on Friday morning, I was in my happy place. My happy place, and always has been, is being at a coffee shop, uh, sitting on the patio or the porch or just the sidewalk, if that's all, all they have, being at a coffee shop outside with a nice, wonderful cup of coffee and an actual newspaper, a legit, no joking paper newspaper. It's fun carrying a paper newspaper out in public nowadays. Everyone's like, oh, look at that. It's like carrying a musket or something. Like, no one expects to see it. You know, they're like, wow, look at that, a paper paper. And so I was reading my paper paper, and I, I had a cup of coffee, and I was in my happy place. I was going to be meeting someone for a cup of coffee. I got there early so I could enjoy my happy place. I'm at the Starbucks over on Montgomery Plaza on West 7th, if you all know where that is. And uh, it wasn't very busy, so I was sitting on their little sidewalk area. There was no one parked up against the Starbucks. There was parking one row over, and a gentleman had backed up in his vehicle and was I uh, was, you know, backed into the parking spot. So he was facing me when he got into his car. And so he got into his car. I'm just kind of sitting there enjoying the morning. And he goes over uh, and he's got his door open. And he's in his car and he's getting fiddled. And then uh, a piece of paper just pops out of the door. And I went like, oh, I, I just had this empathetic response. I hate that, don't you? Like when you're getting into your car and some trash blows out and you've got to get out of your car and climb down and like dig under the car. So I'm watching him and I'm, I'm feeling empathetic. And, uh, and then all of a sudden... 
He's just going like this out of the car. And he's facing me. So I'm staring at him. And it's not that he's accidentally dropped a napkin, as I so Christianly believe. <laughs> no, he's just getting rid of his trash. He's just throwing his trash out into the parking lot in the middle of the, uh, Starbucks. And did I mention I get angry? Did I mention that earlier in the message? I get angry. And uh, it's one of my natural orientations. And so I am so quickly so angry at this guy because it's not just that he's littering. He's littering. It's paper. It's napkins. He's littering. It's what it's, it's just so purposeful. It's so, it's so cognizant and it's so ripe with metaphor, right? I mean, he's so literally saying, this is my trash. This is my garbage. And I've got everything I need to take care of it. And instead, I'm just going to dump it on y'all. And I don't care what it makes dirty. I don't care who has to deal with it. It doesn't matter to me at all. I'm dumping my garbage out here and y'all can deal with it. I don't care. That's metaphorically what he's saying, right? And so I get angry and I break his windshield and I knock some sense into him. No, <laughs> I don't. I do want to say something like really passive aggressive or brilliant, or I don't know, I want to like go over there and like passive aggressively pick up his trash in front of him or something, or like knock on his window and like put it back into it and then buckle his seatbelt for him because he probably doesn't do that either. Um, but I've been thinking about this dumb Bible all week long. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry, and I'm, I'm feeling myself quick to get angry. And I just breathe deep, and it's just napkins. It's not worth getting angry about. And he pulls out, and he drives away. And it's early in the morning. There's no big show. There's no other audience or anything like that. So I just walk out to the parking lot. I get my own napkin, though, to pick up his napkins, because who knows where he's been, guy behaving like that. But I just, I just pick up the napkins, and there's a trash can out there. So I, I put away the napkins, and I wash my hands. And that's that, and I move on. I, I wouldn't have actually thought about it again right? There's no reason. It's a dumb story. Um, the only reason I thought about it is because sermons are long and you have to think of things to talk about. <laughs> but just imagine me 30 minutes later, if I had like confronted this guy over littering in the parking lot, if I had gone up and made some big scene, if I had picked up his trash and put it in the, the bed of his truck, or if I had done something, right? One, I think it's very unlikely that there's any angry confrontation you can do to change somebody. It was probably a lifetime habit of littering. I, I imagine that a stranger can do that in a parking lot. But two, imagine what my heart would be like 30 minutes later, an hour later, a day later. I don't know what kind of person you are. I'm the kind of person where if I get in a heated confrontation, I'm messed up for days, right? I don't need that in my heart. I don't need that in my heart. That kind of thing doesn't build righteousness. And so I've been meditating and thinking about it all week long. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't been thinking so deeply about this scripture, what it means and what it means to leave into it, but I had been. That's the difference that it made in my life in that small, but meaningful way. In the gathering, we just finished a book study. I'm sorry, not the gathering, at the church, the entire church. We just finished a book study on the book of Revelation. It took us seven weeks to get through it. It was the revisiting of one of the most discussed sermon series that I've done in, in a decade plus of ministry. And it takes a long time to get into the book of Revelation. That's why it took seven weeks. It's because Revelation is a book that's written in a different genre of writing called Apocalypse, which requires a lot of teaching and context to better understand what's the message of this text and what is it trying to share with us and what would it have us know. And it's written in a different language. It's written in a different cultural context. It's written in this different genre. It's about these things that are ultimately meaningful in our lives. The book of Revelation is about how to live faithfully in an unfaithful world. It's about trying to understand how goodness and evil are at work in the world. But again, it takes a lot of context and it's a pretty heavy lift for a pastor and a congregation to do. And so I was thinking, what's a good follow-up series? Where should we go after the book of Revelation? Where should we go next? After a couple months of that pretty heavy textual work, where should we go? And I visited the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a set a cycle of three years of readings that many churches, United Methodist churches, mainline churches, Catholic churches around the world use to organize their time of scripture reading together as a congregation. And I noticed that right when we were finishing the book of Revelation series, what does Revelation reveal? They were all going to be embarking on a study of the book of James. 
And I thought, what a perfect digestif after Revelation to get into for the book of James. Because as the book of Revelation is complex and contextual and requires a whole bunch of decoding and better understanding in order to make relevant to our everyday lives, the book of James is meant by design to be easy to pick up. It's meant to be very direct and very applicable. And so as complex as Revelation was, James is straightforward. As metaphorical as Revelation was, James is direct. And so that's going to be an excellent transition, I think, into these next few weeks. We're going to do a book study on the book of James. And beginning in the book of James, I would love to get a little bit of context, where it's from, how it's written, what it's about. It's in the New Testament. I apologize for not updating the, uh, the script. For those of you who are looking on 229 in the Old Testament, it's going to be hard to find James there. And that's on me. Elaine's on vacation. It's a New Testament text, and there's a number of New Testament texts that have the author's name, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are Gospels. Those are stories of Jesus' life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection. There's other New Testament books that are also the author's name, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd John, the book of James. And they're not Gospels, they're different kinds of writing. The book of James is a letter. Now, unlike some letters... 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. I just want to prove to you guys I've read the Bible. (laughs) Unlike some of those letters, which we know are written to very particular audiences about very particular issues, the book of James is a broader letter. It's written, it's meant to be circulated around multiple communities. It's more of an all of us need to think about and know about these things kind of letter. Does that make sense? Hebrews is very much the same way. It's a letter that we all could benefit from. We could all learn from if we were to read it and take its lessons into our heart. It's written by a man named James. There's multiple Jameses in the New Testament. And for a long time, the Christian community and a great deal of scholars today believe that James, the author of this book, is Jesus's younger half-brother, James. It's actually the man who grew up with Jesus. His name is James. And it's interesting, when we read the New Testament, we realize that James does not become a committed follower of Jesus until after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. James is aware of Jesus and his teaching and his preaching and his miracle works and his activities, but he doesn't actually come to fully embrace Jesus' identity as Messiah and Son of God until he's crucified and resurrected. And the reason is obvious is because you have to see your brother die and come back to life before you will believe that he is the Messiah. That is true of everybody everywhere, right? If my brother tells me that he is the son of God, I'm going to need to see you die and come back first before I believe it. That's what happens with James. After Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, he joins these communities of new believers. And we know through the book of Acts and other texts that his role in ministry isn't so much a traveling preacher and apostle like so many others are. He leads the church in Jerusalem, this early community of new believers. He's leading that church in Jerusalem. And he's learned so much about what's happening there in that community that he has to share with people everywhere. One of the things that's happening around the world in the Mediterranean uh, basin, the ancient Near East, in these communities, that there's there's people who are beginning to become Jesus followers. They're beginning to change their lives to follow Jesus. And some are coming from outside the Jewish community, Gentiles, and some are coming from inside the Jewish community. They're coming to believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that God has promised through God's long history with the people of Israel, that he is the Messiah, that he fulfills their messianic expectations. And these believers who are coming to proclaim that that is who Jesus is and that is what God has done are beginning to face a lot of challenges and pushbacks inside their communities. Remember, to be Jewish in that time and place is more than just a set of beliefs. It's more than just these theological statements. It's a culture. It's a community. It's belonging. It's family. It's all of those things. And part of the identity is that this is our thing for us. And so if you're someone who's grown up in that community of faith, then your family and your neighbors, all the people that you do business with, all the people you socialize with, have this shared identity. And so if all of a sudden you leave that shared identity, you have a new faith, a new belief, well, there's really significant consequences in your life, in your community, in your most important relationships. And in the beginning of the book of James, one of the things that he tells us is he's writing to all of these people in the diaspora spread across the world who have this background and who have come to find this new identity in Christ Jesus. And amongst those challenges, 
there is good news, there's hope, there's possibilities. And that's what this is about. And so much of it is direct. So much of it is tangible. So much is directions about how to live your life. The differences that Christ can make and is making in and through you. Remember, James is writing as a pastor. He's someone who's working with people every single day. He's shepherding a community of faith. So he knows their problems. He knows their challenges. And so he's going to get right to the point. He's not going to get deep into the metaphors or the symbolism or all those things that John of Patmos was so passionate about. He's going to write very directly and very pragmatically. And key to what he's saying, key to one of his big theses that he wants to impart on these people who are changing their life to follow Jesus is that it's not just about being hearers of the word. It's not just about receiving this testimony. It's not just about even proclaiming it that you believe this is true. It's about being doers of the word, not just hearers. Don't just be hearers of this word, but be doers of this word. Put it into action. Put it into practice in your own life, in your own thoughts, in your own relationships. Don't just be a receiver of this word. Be a doer. We did a Bible study on the book of James in the season of Advent, the weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas last year, and we called it a Bible doing class and not a Bible study class, a Bible doing class, because that's so key to everything that James wants you to take to heart when you're reading what he has to say. This is about actually changing the way that you think, the way that you act, the way that you treat others, and treat yourselves in your everyday life. We're talking about a faith that works. That's the name of this sermon series, and that's key to James. Not only that your faith compels you into action in this world, into living act uh, differently, into behaving differently, thinking differently, having different priorities, etc. But that your faith works on you in return. It results in changes. It results in reorientations in your own life. It's a faith that works both ways. One of the images that James comes up with that I love so much is this image of a mirror. If you remember that in the text, he calls it a mirror. And I love so much this image, and that's a metaphor that we're going to use over the course of the entire uh, study over these next few weeks. If you're one of the folks who takes notes in your Bible or things like that, you can write, the book of James is like a mirror in your margins. Because so quickly... Over the course of this sermon series, you're going to hear words from Scripture, and you're going to hear words from my mouth that are directives on how to think and to act and to be. How you should speak, how you should treat others, how you should think about wealth, how you should, what you should look at at success, etc. And very quickly, when you're in a worship service or you're watching a worship service online, you're listening to the message, you see a preacher speaking, all of these directions can begin to sound like just more stuff I need to do, or just more ways I'm not measuring up, or just a list item of characteristics that I don't fulfill, and they can just compound feelings of shame or insignificance or inefficiency or unwillingness, and that's not the point at all. It's just meant to be a mirror, a way you can check where you're at, what needs to be adjusted, and where you're trying to go. In my personal life, we've crossed a major threshold in the last year or so, and that is for the first time ever, we are parenting a tween. And it is different. And it is reminding me of my own experience of being a tween, you know, that 11, 12, 13 year old time frame. And just all it makes me want to do is talk to my mom and just tell her I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know. You were so right. You were so right. And one of these, all these things that she was doing to frustrate me and annoy me, I'm now realizing where they're coming from. And can I share an example with you? One of them had to do with me getting ready for school in the morning. And I don't remember the exact logistics, but uh, where I grew up in Northeast Tarrant County, the middle school bus was the first one to pick up. It came very early in the morning. I don't remember exactly what time. Let's say 4.15 a.m. <laughs> that sounds about right. That's what it felt like. So I'm trying to get up and at the bus station by 4.15 a.m., let's say. And so like any reasonable person who is not yet self-conscious, I'm just trying to minimize the amount of time between when I get out of bed and eat a toaster strudel and get out the door, right? I'm trying to just sleep as long as I possibly can and then just get out the door and cut out all the unnecessary stuff. You know that unnecessary stuff we have in our morning routine, like hygiene 
and stuff like that. I just wanted to cut that out and just focus on getting to the door. And I remember I would come downstairs, not really having cared if the clothes had been hung up or if they were in a pile on the floor or if they matched in any way, not having combed my hair, not even having done the most basic aspects of personal hygiene. And I would come downstairs and my mom would look at me and this is probably where I learned the word aghast. <laughs> she would look at me aghast and go, you can't leave the house like this. And I was like, it's fine. I don't care. I don't. And she was like, please, please believe me. You cannot leave the house like this. You have to just comb your hair. You have to brush your teeth. You have to like just clean up a little bit. You cannot wear that shirt. You can't like, you please just do it. And I was like, mom, I don't, it doesn't matter. And we're in our little kitchen, uh, kind of breakfast nookie area. And there is a small half bath right there. And I, I have a very distinct memory of her pleading slash dragging me and her saying, just look in the mirror. Just, just look in the mirror. Because I haven't looked in the mirror, right? Because that would, that would add seconds to my day. Just look in the mirror. I'm like, Mom, I don't need to look in the mirror. I don't need, I know what I look. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll go comb my hair. Just look in the mirror. Just, just become aware of what actually is, right? Just take a second, just pause. Just actually look in the mirror and say, is this what you want, Right? Is this what you think it is? Is this how you want to go about your way in the world? And what I saw back in the mirror wasn't unfixable. It just needed a little bit of adjustment, right? It just needed a little bit of attention. It needed to be paid attention to, and then I can be on my way. The book of James is a mirror. It holds up and in its literary way describes characteristics of what you can expect to see when Christ is at work in your heart and in your life and the way in which that can manifest in you and through you, impacting who you are, how you speak, how you act, how you think, and how you do in the world. It's a mirror that you hold up, not to condemn you, not to make you feel bad, not to fill you with shame, but rather to say, this is all possible. Are you in alignment here? Are you seeing what you wanna see or is it time for an adjustment? before you go ahead about your day. And this last bit is key. If you've been at this church for a long time, if you've heard me speak for a long time, you've heard this before, but forgive me, I have to repeat it because this is important, particularly for people who are newer to experiencing Christianity, faith, and how it is to live as a follower of Jesus. It's key for you to understand that when we talk about changes in our lives, how we think, how we act, how we feel, what we do in the world, it is not dependent upon your willpower to make those changes. A key understanding of what happens when we actually start living and following Christ, not just affirming what it is about him or saying that we believe to be true aspects of his character or his origin or things like that. But when we actually begin to take into our heart, seriously following him every single day, then one of the things that happens is his grace, his power, his presence becomes to actually take hold of us and give us the strength to do those things. James talks about that when he talks about receiving with meekness. Another word for that would be humility or understanding of your own limitations. Receive with weakness or with meekness, the implanted word, the word inside of you, the presence of Christ in you, the implanted word, not just the heard word or the affirmed word, the implanted word that has the power, that has the strength, that has the ability to save your soul, to change your life, to change your relationships, to change your family, your community, the world. Receive with meekness and humility that implanted word, that power and presence of Christ inside of you, that power to actually make a change. It's not up to your own will. It's not up to your own strength of character. It's possible because of him. Me talking about overcoming anger in the parking lot of Starbucks because somebody is littering is a small and low stakes example. Let me ask you though, who's doing that in your life? Who is taking their garbage, their trash, their baggage, their mess, and just throwing it onto your plate, whether you like it or not? Who is taking their mess, their dirt, their garbage, and just throwing it out and leaving it for you to deal with? And how much is anger a reasonable and understandable response to that? 
but does any righteousness actually come from it? Is it rather instead the power of Christ, who Christ is, the work of Christ, and the presence of Christ that might just give you the strength to respond in some other way? And here's the key point. How will your soul be if you do? What kind of difference will it make in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, if you lean in that way? We're going to focus on a faith that works. And one of the things that I know you guys all love is homework. Those are the two things everyone loves from me. They love homework and they love when the sermon goes long. (laughs) So here's your homework. We did a doers of the word class in January, and this was their homework in the, in the uh, Bible doing class. This is your homework. Something's going to pop up this week. Your natural response is going to be slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to anger. That's going to be your natural response. I'm going to invite you to take that moment, look for that opportunity, find it. Is it in an intimate relationship? Is it with a coworker, a colleague, a customer, a supervisor? I'm going to invite you to be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. I'm going to ask you to look back and reflect and say, what's the difference in my spirit when I did? No matter how big, no matter how small, what's the difference when I'm not just a hearer of this word, but a doer of this word? And what change does it make in my world, in my relationships, in my heart, my soul? Receive with meekness and humility this implanted word that has the power to save your soul, to save your life, to save your community, to save your relationships. And may we all be blessed together this week. Let's pray. Great and loving God, great are you and greatly to be praised. Lord, help us to receive with humility this implanted word that has the power to save our hearts, to change our lives, to save our souls. God, we ask that you guide us, shape us, form us, and lead us in the way of your son Jesus. For it's together as his people that we trust in him and say the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers to begin to come forward so that all of us can participate in this presentation of our tithes and offerings. And as always, we want to thank you for your faithfulness, for your generosity, also for your intentionality. Uh, For many of you here this morning, you'll be actually placing a gift into the offering plates, and we thank you for that. Many of you here, many of you who are worshiping online, you will probably do this in the way that many in our church do, and that is to give online, somehow through our website and in other ways for you to to give electronically, and we thank you for that. And also, I want to thank all of you who set up recurring gifts, who go that extra step to say, I don't want to think about it if we're on vacation or things are busy. We set up this recurring gift that will happen you know, every week, every month. So thank you for those of you who do that. If you don't do that and you'd like to learn more information, we invite you to contact us and we'll put you in touch with Steve Fagan and his financial team. It's so easy and it's another way for us to be faithful and generous and be the church together. And so now let us pray. Oh God, for this moment and for these gifts, And for all the ways that you use us, we give you thanks and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a closer walk with thee. This song was first recorded, known recorded, in 1941 by Selah Jubilee Gospel Quartet. This is our first hymn that also doubles as a jazz standard. 
This became very popular during the jazz era where Ella Fitzgerald, Dizzy Gillespie, Bob Dylan, and Johnny Cash even made these songs become popular, being sung not just in church, but also on the radio. And growing up in the 80s, I could see the television still now. And if I have a word association with just a closer walk with thee, it is Loretta Lynn. I can just see her singing that in my television or in my living room because that's what I'm used to hearing. In the 1960s though, before, this song became very popular and added to the New Orleans uh, funeral march alongside with uh, the famous when the saints go marching in. So our instructions today, it's not in your hymnals, it's in our faith we sing, sorry we don't have those in our hymnal, but the words will be on the screen. Men, you will sing our first verse together, then we'll all sing together the refrain. Women, you will sing verse two together, and then we'll all sing the refrain. In verse three, we shall all skate together and sing the third verse together. Let us stand together as we sing, just...
The jazzy doxology is always my favorite. <laughs> it's just greatness. Three things before you leave. Uh, number one, to my left, you see Kimberly, you see Joseph, they're at our on-ramp area. They invite you to come down to say hello. If you're looking for ways to connect here in our church, if you're wanting places to serve, if you're a guest or a visitor with us, they have gifts for you. Come get a gift. They would love to meet you, learn more about you, so that you can be actively part of this congregation. And then to my right, you see Marcia. She's at the congregational care area. And if you came wanting to have a prayer with someone today, Marcia is there and she would love to pray with you. And then finally, number three, Pastor Lance, is it true that we are in a sacred time in the Christian calendar. This is the sacred time of the potluck. I invite you to all come and participate. It is the third and unofficial sacrament of the United Methodist Church. It is beautiful. We gather on Wednesday nights in Wesley Hall from 6 to 7.30. Bring anything that you like. We pack Wesley Hall every single time. You sit down, you make new friends. It is so wonderful. If you can't stay the entire time, that's quite all right. We understand. If you've got little ones, we have some activities for them. If you've got itty bitties, we have high chairs. There's no excuse. Please come join us again this Wednesday. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.